a very hearty welcome to all of you. And uh, it's now my pleasure uh, to give the floor to uh, Lisa Lindström. Please uh, give her a big hand. Now, good, because yes. I had to take off my clothes to get this ready, and I don't think that we should do that on stage. Uh, so, thank you so much for inviting me to moderate this. For those who do not know me, I'm a designer, and I'm an entrepreneur, and I'm an advisor to our government when it comes to these questions. So for me, this is an afternoon evening, about being curious, I think. What can we learn? How can we reflect together and be open of what Sweden can learn from Germany and also what we maybe could learn from each other? Uh, I like interaction. Uh, so I asked if we could have a hashtag. It's super small, but it says hashtag IVA1919. So if any of you are super shy of asking questions by raising your hand and be given a microphone, you can also ask questions on this hashtag and I'll try to, to ask them. So to kick this off, uh, we will uh, listen to our distinguished guest and I would like to welcome Mr. Uh, Peter Wekeser to the stage. Bold. Now I'm on. <laughs> so, um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure for me to, to be here. And uh, thank you very much um, to the organizers for the invitation. And I, I want to start the presentation with uh, a little bit lowering the expectation <laughs> to my presentation. Uh, the title is What Can uh, Sweden Learn from, from Germany? Um, and uh, I certainly can't speak for Germany. And uh, I can maybe speak a little bit for Siemens and share some experiences and some stuff that we're doing at Siemens. I can certainly also share a little bit of stuff that's being done in Germany. Um, but I'm also here, of course, to learn from the discussion from you. So it's, uh, for me, it's also what can I personally and what can Siemens learn uh, from Sweden. So, so it's definitely both, uh, both aspects um, that I want, want to take home after the presentation today. So, what am I going to talk about? Um, actually, I had to, un under this big umbrella of Industry 4.0, I'll give you a very brief introduction of what, what that is. Um, I tell you what I like ab uh, about it, I will also tell you what I don't like so much about it. And then I have p picked one particular topic, and that's out of the area of Internet of Things. Um, and I will talk about an offering that we have created at, at Siemens that creates uh, an open industrial cloud ecosystem. And I will talk a little bit about technology. I will also talk about business models. And I will talk very much about how technology and new business models will also change the way we do business um, with each other. All right. Um, to get started, um, it's... I want to, want to start with uh, basically a, a bold statement, and I will give you examples for this, this bold statement. Digitization, and there are many terms out there, digitization, IoT, Industry 4.0, um, all these have a big overlap with, with each other, and there's one thing that, that these topics really have in common. Th developments are becoming faster, and the world is changing faster than ever before. Um, you will already see that, I think, on my, on my second slide, that the pace is significantly increasing. And it's not only technology, it's also business models, it's the, model, the way how we behave, how we interact with our partners and our customers. Now, 
Just two slides on Industry 4.0. Industry 4.0 is actually an initiative that was created in Germany. It has a German name. Um, and it was an initiative that was started um, by German industry and sponsored by the German government. Under this umbrella of Industry 4.0, we have a good number of, of initiatives. And these initiatives have, have one thing in mind, really to drive the next wave of technology, the next wave of business model into industry. But we also clearly see, and this is maybe what I don't like so much about um, the term Industry 4.0, this being too much of a German initiative, that we Siemens, most uh, of our partners, um, most of our competitors, um, um, most of our customers do really international business. So we cannot focus an initiative on one country today only. Um, so things become global. And of course, very similar programs have been launched in other countries. Uh, there's the Industrial Internet Consortium in the US. Uh, the Chinese are, are launching their initiatives around this, the Japanese uh, in Korea. So basically all around the world, it's not only industry, but it's also government supporting industry initiatives to drive the next generation of how we do business. Now, what, what do these initiatives uh, have, have in, in common? And now, I'm, I'm really reflecting towards uh, the business areas of Siemens, and which, which is really... Uh, in the industrial domain, in the transportation domain, in the energy generation uh, domain. We see a very strong integration of value-add networks. So it's not only companies, a single company, that can provide a full value proposition, but it's models how you partner, um, how you work with your customers, how you even partner in some areas with your competitors. Um, for industrial manufacturing, this is the area that I um, that I come from for s from in Siemens. Um, we clearly see a seamless integration of the full engineering process. What does engineering process mean? Um, at Siemens, we we have come up with a vision and we have started to implement a vision of having a seamless tool chain that helps our customers design their products. We have tools for mechanical design of products. We have tools for electrical design. We have tools for automation design. And our customers cannot only use this design process to design the products. We also have all the simulation tools to simulate the product before you ever have built the first prototype of that product. What's being created in that design pro process is what we call a digital twin. So a digital model of the product. But we have taken that idea one step further. As most customers, once they have built a digital model, want to really make the product, the tangible product, it's only the game designers who uh, can work with a digital model. So if you, if you um, want to have a product that's called Need for Speed or something else, you may be okay with a digital model, but there are other companies like Volvo who at the end want to build a real car. Um, so they need to think about how do I really produce the real car from the digital model. And the next step is how do I build the manufacturing environment. Here you go through a very similar process. You design the manufacturing equipment. There's a mechanical design, an electrical design, an automation design. And then there's a process flow. So you need to have a process design as well. So how do you manufacture the product, not only what is the bill of material, but also what is the bill of process? How is the product being created? And then once you've done that, of course, you can simulate your manufacturing process. You can simulate cycle times. You can simulate production output in, in a factory. We also have created the tools for that. And now all these tools are built on one common data collaboration platform. But we are taking it even one step further than that. That additional step that we are taking is Siemens has a strong history um, and a strong legacy in providing automation products to help our customers 
build automated manufacturing environments. We sell these products to machine builders. We sell these products to end customers who use these products to automate and, and drive machines and complete manufacturing lines. Now we have integrated the design process for the products and the design process for, for the manufacturing equipment with the real realization process, with the build process. So again, the data that's being created in the design process of the products and in the design process of the, of the production equipment can be used then in the real factory. So again, build on the same um, data collaboration platform. <coughs> and once you then build the real factory or have built the real factory or the real product, both, um, now we have the capability to, th these products and, f and, and manufacturing assets, they produce data through their life cycle now. So it's machines producing data, um, it's products like car producing data, and now it becomes important to reuse that data that's being used over the life cycle of these products. Um, and feed this, this, this information that comes from the real product back into the digital model that was created in the design process. And this is a little bit the focus that I will have in my presentation today, that vertical integration. How do we help our customers um, to feed data out of production assets um, back into the design process? And how can you turn data from the production asset into value into improved output, into reduced downtime. So this was kind of a long introduction on the, um, on the first slide. Um, maybe one more slide on Industry 4.0. Why is it called 4.0? Um, the name 4.0 was created because it's considered the fourth industrial revolution. So it's probably not us, but the next generation that will have to judge if it's really a revolution. But the three other revolutions that we had an industry is the first revolution around the 1800s um, when um, steam and water were introduced to drive machines. So from mechanical labor to, to really machines uh, supporting the work. Then in the late 1800s, early uh, around 1900, uh, the first automated production lines were actually introduced in slaughterhouses in, in the US and Chicago. This is one, when electricity began to drive the, the, the industrial production process, interestingly in food production. And then these, these uh, Conveyor lines uh, were copied by the early car manufacturers in the US. The next industrial revolution was when automation was introduced. That was in the 70s. And now the, the revolution, the fourth revolution, um, is the revolution of cyber physical systems and that whole integration of engineering workflow um, mechatronical components that deliver data, have a certain intelligence, and intelligently work together. So, but again, it's up to the next generation to judge if that is really a revolution. But that's a little bit, maybe, the history uh, on why is it 4.0 and not 7.0. Now, I want to talk a little bit about why is technology changing business models? And I want to share a few examples, examples that you all know, and uh, I want to put them on the next slides in a different perspective, because these examples on this slide are really from, from consumer industries. Um, you all know the, the success of Amazon, who started as a book retailer, now is the world's largest online retailer for basically everything. And this is not only a new technology that Amazon introduced, it's a completely new way of doing business. And it had a significant influence on the retail business, completely changed and revolutionized the retail business. Um, Spotify. Probably most people here in the room remember still going to a record store and buying a record. Um, my kids don't know what a record is anymore today. Um, we all remember what a CD is. Maybe sometimes we can buy still a CD today, because, but most of you hardly probably do that anymore. And then the next step was downloading music. 
And the next step after that was streaming music. And that happened in less than two decades. A complete change. And that was first a technological change. From record to CD is only a technological change. To downloading music is again only a technological change. But then going from downloading music to streaming music is a complete business model change. Because you don't own the music anymore. You just consume it. And you consume it wherever, whenever, um, together with whomever you want to consume it. So completely change of business model. And the interesting thing, it this change... This disruptive change put many very established players in that market out of business and it's completely new companies now dominating this, this business. So there is opportunity and risk at the same time when we see these kinds of disruptive changes. I don't want to go into the other examples. You know them as well. You know Uber and uh, um, Yellow Pages and, and uh, lots of online marketing, uh, marketplaces. The, the interesting thing here is really two things. It's significant change. It's disruptive. So companies went out of business. It was all triggered by technology, but it's not only technology. It's also the change of business models that many established players in these marketplaces couldn't embrace and, uh, well, lost their leading position or completely went out of business. Now, what we see in this, these examples is a paradigm shift. And this is a paradigm shift which goes away from tangible assets more towards being able to um, consume products. So it's not only always necessary anymore to own a product, but customers, also our customers, more and more want to talk with, uh, with us about the output that a product generates and want to pay at the end for the output. So it's more going to an output-oriented or a, um, a user-centric mindset. I give you, and now you could say, okay, that happens in consumer industries. Does this happen in other industries as well? I have a Two examples that I want to share with you where this happens not only in consumer industries, and we see that with our customers every day now. Um, airline industries, uh, turbines for airlines. There are a handful of manufacturers, large manufacturers, airline turbines. They completely changed their business model. They do not sell these turbines anymore, but they all have invented and power by the hour model. So they basically lease the, the turbine um, to a company that holds the asset. And then they sell flight hours to the airline. They charge the airline a full service concept by flight hours. The airline has to commit to a minimum flight hours per turbine. And then the, pr the, provi the, the, airline, the turbine manufacturer provides a full service concept around the turbine. This is a completely changed business models, model. In this case, all the established players has, have basically embraced the same model. Now, I'll give you one more example, more going into the industrial space where we feel at home. Compressors. We have customers today who build compressors. They are now thinking and are being, well, almost forced by their customers who, who, who used to buy compressors because they needed compressed air for their production processes. These end customers don't want to buy compressors anymore. They want to buy compressed air. Um, and, and with this change, it's, it, this is a business model change again. The end customer wants to buy compressed air, and the end customer decides um, on the vendor who can provide compressed air at the best price. In the past, it was an asset decision, which compressor do I buy? And then I had to operate this compressor, watch the energy consumption, um, take care of spare parts, maintenance and everything, or hire somebody to do that. For the OEM who sells the compressor, the service process has, has become a completely different business model. In the old model, the, the OEM wanted to sell as much service as possible because they made a lot of money on the service. Now, service became really only a cost component to uh, providing compressed air. So complete change of how these machine builders are uh, approaching the, their, their business model and will have to approach that. And we see that more and more that our customers, which are, mainly, which are very often machine builders, um, have to go through business model changes. Now, what I want to talk about next 
is um, now I have one more slide that that gives you a little bit an overview what's uh, what's from our viewpoint that's a Siemens viewpoint now happening um, in the various industries. We we saw example from consumer industries where these changes have happened pretty quickly. Um, these changes were driven by technologies, digitization, sensors, big data, IoT, cloud. Um, streaming analytics, you have heard all these these words. Now, all these technologies have reached a level of maturity where they can be applied for new business models. And there are companies out there doing that. <coughs> um, now, we saw in, in a couple of examples, media, trade, also mobility and healthcare, that these industries are already pretty far along in embracing this, these new technologies and these new trends. We, for the industries that, that my business represents, uh, process industries and manufacturing industries, um, we see this coming now pretty rapidly. When we talked about this three years ago, this was still at a level where customers are, oh, interesting idea, um, but not relevant for me yet. In the last three years, I personally, in many discussions that I'm having with customers, see a tremendous change. And now customers really <coughs> coming to us and saying, we need to talk to you tomorrow because this is crucial for our, for our business to embrace this change. And other industries like energy will follow very soon here. And I probably have many industries not on the chart. And my personal prediction is all these industries will go through similar trends at, at maybe a different speed. Nobody, not all the industries will be as fast as the music industry going through a full transformation, but there will be a transformation. Now, how I want to give you one example now of the out of the Siemens portfolio, what have we done and, and give you a little bit of an idea how do we work with our customers and how do we uh, support our customers with an open Siemens platform. Well, this is actually now a, an activity that started in the service business of Siemens. We were thinking, my team was thinking about how can we optimize our own service business for the assets that we sell to our customers. And the idea was we need to introduce a certain technology that we have a platform that allow, allows us full access to these, to these assets, allows us to collect data from these assets, allows us to e evaluate the data, make predictions about the future of this asset to optimize our service, to send out a service technician when we know the product will need service in a week from now. So even before the customer really realizes that the product needs service, so in order to avoid downtimes of manufacturing equipment. And very interestingly, we, we couldn't go through a classical model of designing a new product, then implementing this new product, which takes us three years, and then rolling that out. But we had to go through very rapid cycles of innovation, testing projects, and providing a service offering. And we went through all these cycles several times. And this was more a startup type approach of building something, testing it, getting feedback very quickly, if things were on the right track, we went on. If things, if we didn't produce the results that we or customers expected, we changed the approach. So a very agile approach in the in the development process. So what the result now is, is an open ecosystem. Let, let me just go back one second. When I say development process, this, this is a three three parts which are important. It's technology, but it's not only technology. At Siemens. We are all in love with technology, so we have the tendency to only think about technology. But it's also processes and organization, and it's business models that you have to, to look at at the same time as you go through these innovation cycles. So technology might change the business model or vice versa, or might have an influence on processes in the organization. Now, the result is... Um, or one example that I want to present today is a is an open ecosystem, and we strongly believe in open ecosystems because we don't believe that we can provide everything a customer needs, but we need to work, think in ecosystems and provide technology platforms where can where we can have partners join to really create the full value proposition that a customer needs. And this ecosystem is an IoT ecosystem, an open platform with open device connectivity 
connectivity and also an open application environment for customers to build their own application. This is now very specific for manufacturing environments. What we have created with the Siemens MindFear platform is a platform which allows us to or allows our customers to connect all their manufacturing assets. And interestingly, we in Siemens are a market leader in automation equipment. We have products like Sematics, Numerics, Dynamics that are being used in all kinds of manufacturing processes, in car manufacturing, in bottling of beer, uh, in chemical manufacturing processes. And we have enabled all these products with a device to cloud connectivity based on an open standard. Uh, of course, we enable our products to plug and play connect to this cloud platform, but we haven't we, we built this on an open standard that also third party companies can connect their product the same way to that cloud platform. Then in the area of cloud, um, the, the at least the production industries are very particular about their data. Um, so we had to build an infrastructure and a platform that allows our customers to make the decision where their data resides, either in a public cloud environment, in a private cloud em environment, or even on-premise. Um, so there's the openness for the customer to make that decision on where the data resides. And then thirdly, um, the third dimension of openness is that the applications that can be deployed in this cli cloud environment there are Siemens applications, so there's a fleet management applications that we can provide to customers. There is a predictive drive um, application where we can predict potential failures of our drive systems that we sell to customers. There's a Siemens application to predict industrial ne network uh, problems. But we completely allow customers to build their own applications. We allow OEMs to build their uh, own applications. We allow end customers to build their own applications. And why is this necessary? Because the OEMs, the end customers, they have the domain know-how about their production assets, about their machines that they build. And they use this as a platform to scale their business, to optimize their service um, operations. Um, and the experience here was it's really necessary to think in open ecosystems where we allow others to really join in. So this is almost my, my last slide. I'll go over that slide real quickly. Very important for such an ecosystem, it needs to be extremely easy for the customer to use. So we basically have a very simple cookbook, how to connect an asset, how to configure the data uh, that this asset provides to the cloud platform, and then run an application or create a service based on this, on this cloud platform. And um, to, to close the presentation and uh, then go into discussion, what what we have um, provided here as one component of that vision of uh, Industry 4.0 is make it very easy um, to collect data out of industrial production assets, um, connect them to a cloud platform which is globally 24 uh, um, accessible, which has all the, the uh, user authentication and security features uh, which, which are required built, uh, built in. This cloud platform comes uh, with data analytics tools which make it easy for our customers to analyze their own data. And, and data is not really what customers are interested in. It's the capability of turning data into actionable information to base decisions on that, when to do a service for an equipment, when to send out a service technician, or when to reduce the cycle time so that uh, the asset will not break down before there's an, the next plant maintenance uh, downtime. And that really starts, the discussions with our customers today start not on the lower level how to connect the platform and how to get the data, but we have now introduced a small team that goes out initially with the customers and helps customers in the business model discussion. So what how do I have to change my business model to be more future-oriented, to be more competitive? And then once we have defined the business model together with, with the customers, we talk about how it has this to be implemented. So with this, I want to close my introduction and uh, leave you with a message that 
I'm convinced that technology drives significant change through almost any industry, um, that a lot of business models will go away from product-oriented business models towards more service or output-oriented business models. Um, the, the last statement I want to make, this can be a threat if you don't do anything. It can be a huge opportunity if you embrace this opportunity and actively drive it forward. So with this, I want to thank you for your attention. And now I'm not sure, do we have time for questions? Or, uh, or Lisa, how do you want to? Thank you. And let's see if we have any questions. Do we have any questions? OK, nope. uh, while you're thinking and formulating your questions, and I haven't seen them on Twitter yet, uh, I have a question. So from this really, really interesting journey, what would you say has been something that we can learn from, a challenge? Um, hmm. I mean, there, there were probably a lot of things that I personally took away. Um, and and maybe the, the biggest learning was when we started, we looked at this as a technical problem that we had mm. to solve. Um, and yes, there are lots of technical problems in that. But this is not the hardest piece. Um, we can usually get the technical problem somehow solved. <laughs> but really getting the buy-in and, and, and managing the transformation of business models, managing the transformation of how you go to market, Managing the transformation, how you work with partners and customers, that's the hardest piece. And do and you have any tips and tricks for how you do that? Um, be open. Um, listen to your customers. Uh, also, take some risk. Hmm. Uh, you can't predict everything. You have to embrace risk to some point. If you, if you don't embrace risk and if you're not willing to take risk, you will probably stay where you are. That's a good advice. And and reflecting a little bit on on Germany and what do you think what what do you think that what kind of support do you think that you have been given? And that's the support that have, has been given was not 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 really support that we got from the government. So this is something which is also a little bit unusual for Siemens. Um, there was a board member who very early said the decision, we want to try this, we are willing to take some risk, even if this is a complete failure at the end, it's worth doing it. And then, of course, the, the challenge is we have our quarterly budget reviews. And, of course, uh, this is not as predictable as uh, some other businesses where you exactly know what you are doing. Um, but you still have to go through these, these reviews in a big company like Siemens. I'm sure you have similar stuff in, in, in your companies. And if you try something completely new, also the normal business processes can't be a, a applied the, f the, the normal way. Mm. It, it's also here certain risk-taking and you can't plan for the next five years. You have to plan in shorter cycles. And you have to also be willing uh, to adapt your plans if you see don't, things don't work exactly the way you have originally planned. But you need to have a vision, kind of a polar star that you think this is where we want to go to. Many advices here. Any questions? Yes? Hi, Per Storm, Copper Stone Resources. Using X as a service, that means that your customers can reduce their balance sheet, right? Mm -hmm. They have, as you wrote, OPEX instead yeah. of CAPEX. Yeah. But going down five or ten years down the road, won't this mean that Siemens will get a bloated balance sheet? And no. how will you reduce your balance sheet mm -hmm. Actually, in that we, case? Yeah, good, very good question. Actually, um, our business model is not to put any assets on our balance sheet either. Um, so um, so it's not that, that we will keep motors and drives and uh, automation systems on, on our balance sheet. Um, we, we are going clearly towards an, a, a software as a service business, but there are companies who are specialized on keeping balance on their balance sheet. So if you take the, the, the turbine example, it's not Rolls-Royce and it's not uh, um, Lufthansa carrying these assets on their balance sheet, but 
Um, it's a bank that basically carries the the assets and of course charges interest uh, for carrying carrying the assets on the balance sheet. It's a third party. It's a third party. Yeah, and it's not our business model at Siemens to to take customer assets on our balance sheet. But clearly, customers want to reduce their balance sheet, uh, the assets on their balance sheet as well. I think we have one more question. So, uh, uh, it's very interesting to listen to you, and uh, I'm coming from a, a truck company, and it belongs to Volkswagen today. Uh, mm -hmm. And we started here in Sweden very early, I have to say, 15 years ago, we started to see what can we do with the telecommunication mm -hmm. and to uh, uh, connect the vehicles uh, with us, but also with the customers. And uh, it has been a very long journey mm. in it, but uh, more or less the same experiences as you uh, tell us about here. But I'm missing a little bit, and I would like to hear your experience. This has, at least for us, been a cultural revolution in the mindset mm -hmm. of the people, not only in the company, also among our customers. Mm -hmm and also among our employees and the employees of the customers to embrace this. And especially at uh, the middle management level that is handing out a lot of uh, power, decision power, to the user <coughs> of the machine that uh, has to take the decisions. And uh, we have had problems from time to time with this. And uh, we have been rather hard in empowering people. Mm -hmm. Because this will never fly without empowering people. So we go also from an old traditional order-giving uh, leadership model very much to a decentralized learning uh, mm -hmm. leadership model. What, what's your experience here? I mean, I I can fully underline what what you what you said. This is a this is a change process, and and a continuous learning process. And we are not through that process. I'm not sure that it ever ends. Um, this is a continuous process where you will have to continuously adopt and change. And of course, now we are in a phase where we see a lot of rapid changes in a relatively sh short time. Um, and and this is um, give you a few examples. Um, th this team that started this MindSphere project, that's about five years back. Um, we had to change the organization of their teams at least five times. At least. Um, because we saw, okay, we ha the, the way we work together, that, that needs to be different. Um, then the go-to-market model, how do we sell? Whom do we partner with? Who is our friend? Who is our enemy in this business? This picture changed over time. This was not a static picture. Um, and when we, when we initially started, we didn't start with an op open ecosystem, but we, we, we started with a model, we want to have, have the best analytics for our Siemens assets. But then we realized our Siemens assets are only part of a customer solution. And we cannot provide meaningful an, um, analytics for the other parts that the customer uses. But we have to be open here. And we have to basically invite others to use the same technologies and, and work on the same platform. This was a big step thinking in for us, where we had in the past a lot of proprietary systems and solutions. To think in open ecosystem was a big change. And this, this is not so much technology. Technology is relatively easy. Um, it's business models. It's mindset. And of course, if you then change business models, you change organizations. That means you change little kingdoms in your own company. Um, so it, it's it's all of that, and that's a continuous change process. And and I I see that that's not stopping, but this will continue, and it's maybe even accelerating. Does that answer your your question? Yeah. 
Thank you. Let's have one more question and then we open for our panelists and we will have even more questions after. Yes. Good evening. I'm from the Swedish Standards Institute and uh, I wonder to what extent uh, standardization has contributed to create this open ecosystem that you, that you want to have. Mm -hmm. um, I think standards are extremely important um, because if you, if you build platforms you need to have stable interfaces, how you connect devices, stable interfaces, how customers can build applications. But I think the way how we get to standards has changed. The, the way we, how we define standards, the classical way is we created committees. The committees wa worked for a couple of years and then published a specification on a standard. And I think that, that has changed already dramatically in the IT industry. Um, standards are being created by groups that get together um, and by users who like certain technologies. And that attracts more users um, and de facto standards get created all of a sudden. Um, so I think standards are extremely important and these platforms and other platforms and ecosystems need standards because that you need to be able to, to build your business model on a standard, and that can't be changed every day. This, can, this also means it can't be proprietary or up to one company to change that, that standard. Um, so I'm absolutely convinced that open source models, crowdsourcing, and, and uh, um, basically users create more and more de facto standards. So the process is changing how we get to standards. But standards are still equally important, I think, like in the past. Thank you. Let's uh, thank you once again. Thank you. <coughs> <coughs> and I, have, I, I just have so many questions right now. For example, where are all the students who are going to work with HR and cultural change? Are, are you in here? Like they really need to listen to you to understand this is what they're going to work with. Maybe, maybe they know and they know everything already so they don't have to be here or... Hmm. So I was, we will introduce the panelists by uh, letting you get to know them by them have like two, three minutes to give their reflections and perspectives on this. It's going to be a challenge. And the first one is Professor Lars Nielsen, uh, who's from Linköping University, and you're also the program director for WASP. 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 And WASP, WASP is what? It's the Wallenberg <coughs> Autonomous Systems Program. Great. And you actually have a few slides. Do you want like to show? Like one. Like Good. the next one. Like the next one. Go ahead. Thank you. So, Wallenberg um, uh, Autonomous Systems Program uh, is the so far biggest individual research program in Sweden. It has a very sizable budget over uh, 11 years. It's, as the name says, it's a program, it's not a project. So, the basic idea is to build up the competence in Sweden by uh, research and research education. Um, it's not in the name, but as a red thread through it is software. And in mind, in perspective, uh, is a number of uh, applications, like the connected society, where everything is connected, and you cannot manage that manually. You need some sort of self-coordination, uh, self-instruction and learning, independent decision-making. We have the uh, autonomous mind, and we have... Uh, uh, autonomous X, this is the autonomous transport system, smart cities and many other applications. Um, we have a research program with three strategic areas, vehicle, robots, humans of course, systems of systems including uh, not artifacts, not man-made systems, but systems, software system, call centers, economy, etc., banks for instance. And software as a strategic uh, area where you think about the whole software, say in a new car, uh, what's the architecture, what's the technology. Two things there. How do you solve it with computer, software, etc.? And another aspect is methodology. How do you work? I think hundreds of man years are going into these systems. What's the process of working with this? 
And then there are the thematic areas, so to say, the disciplines, um, starting with situation awareness, where you take in the sensors, so you have the information from the internet, it reinforces data, you build a situation awareness situation, then you do planning, control, etc. Um, three important instruments. Um, we have plans for large arenas research wise, like if you make a similarity, for instance, in physics, you have CERN, you have a big European arena where physicists come and do research. Uh, we have Max 4 in physics also. Creating industry, creating, so to say, research arena where you can come and test your ideas, an open arena for everyone. Um, very ambitious graduate school program with industrial do uh, PhD students. And we have a recruitment program that where we will be able to recruit to Sweden at least 18 high-profile uh, positions. And as said, very sizable budget. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just ask something about that laboratory? Do you yes. both test your ideas and your ways of working? Yes. Hmm. But ma mainly ideas. But, but there is a trend now talked about in the Swedish industry uh, worldwide where you go from research and development, R&D, to experiment and scale. You, I mean, you start more testing and see if you can scale it up. So in that way, we are going to try how the ways we work. Going from R&D to ENS, mm. that's the industrial perspective on it. Interesting, thank you so much. And let's take, um, yeah. <laughs> and please and please stay, please stay. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, and then uh, let's invite Matthias Falkenhag. You are a partner at Netlight, and let's listen to your perspective without slides. Yes. Um, uh, first of all, uh, those of you who don't know Netlight, I would say that we are or try to be the digital transformation consultants. And what I've done the last ten years is about. Uh, building new offices all around Europe, I would, I would say, or trying to do that. And, and I think that we are mainly known about uh, building organizations without hierarchies and, and just autonomous organizations, I would say, which is a very interesting part when we talk about Industry 4.0. But I would like to start with, um, and also to refer to, to, to Peter here, because very often when we talk about this topic, it is reduced to, when we talk about digitalization, it is reduced to techniques. And, and uh, being an engineer myself, I love techniques, but, but, but still I think that we need to understand what is the driver. Because sometimes we get too stuck in what techniques can actually perform, but we don't really understand why. And also what we need to understand is that digitalization cannot be isolated. There are no more digital strategies, I would say. There are only strategies in a digital world. And, and, and what is also interesting when we, because we work with so many different business areas, is that the challenges are more or less the same, or they are very, very common. And what I always hear when we talk about this, this topic, it is somehow related to personalization or individualization. That I would say that especially when we talk about the revolution <laughs> about digitalization, I would say that we need to understand that it might not be that it's automation and robotics in the center, but instead techniques for people that people are in the center. And I think that that creates a whole new different perspective in how you, how you should do this. And also when we think about the awareness of people, the, the, the level of education, for example. And, and also if, if we look what has happened within digitalization, it is that it has happened about, it's about collaboration and openness. And I think that digitalization wouldn't have gone as fast if it wasn't, for example, for the open source culture, or if it wasn't for the sharing of everything, uh, and, and also re-engineering what, what already had been built. <laughs> because the fun fact here is actually that the digital industry, if we talk about media or the, the really matured in industries, 
they have actually borrowed the terms like lean production and added automation and turned it into agile development. And, and what I think is really interesting right now is that we see more and more clients from the production industry with more or less turn around, as, as Peter uh, talks uh, uh, to, to create not only hardware products, but also software. And, um, and I think that and the, the huge initiatives that they actually have, I think that we can maybe see that they might become the new pioneers uh, as well. So it's, it's some. So are you then saying that all companies will become software companies? No, uh, I'm just saying that you need to. I, I think that that uh, production companies have been too much of product. Uh, uh, products uh, and it's like Peter says as well you need to understand what is the driver of digitalization because in the end it will be a user there and the user needs to you know uh, use something <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so, so I think that we, we and if we understand what is the driver I think that we will have less of the questions to say that, okay, how do we keep up and what kind of techniques do we invest in because it's a, such a huge investment and everything is going so fast and instead trying to understand what is the driver and put you all your efforts there because then you will, all, then you will be the pioneer, I would say, instead of just saying that, the, okay, now we, we invested in these techniques and it didn't work out. Hmm. Thank you. Super interesting uh, <laughs> perspective. And let's invite our, our third panelist, Tobias Holmström, who is the CTO at Volvo. Thank you. Can, let's make sure that all, you can all be here. That we have a table. All yes. <laughs> so what's well, your reflection and perspective on this? Everything that has been said is, of course, very much connected to what we have done. And uh, some, you asked uh, Matthias then, will every company be a software company in the future? Yeah. I would say yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I go back 30 years in time, when our industry, and I heard Leif, I think, somewhere here, we started 30, 40 years back in industry, starting then with uh, real-time software and so on, mechatronics. So, I mean, I can't change one thing in our components without then touching some software in our, uh, in our vehicles. And we have so much computer power today, and we have uh, so much... Um, connectivity in our vehicles, so uh, that is completely impossible. Hmm. And it has revolutionized w what we are doing. Mm -hmm. Everything from uh, preventive maintenance, connectivity, uh, smart clouds, so say, and we... Uh, so uh, what we put our money into right now, it's very much about software development and connectivity in our vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, by also then creating... We t we'll talk, or I think we'll talk about uh, autonomous vehicles and so on. That is something that will come very much. Um, so what Peter talked about also then, the complete supplier chain, which is connected to everything from product development all the way through sales. We have a connected system all the way through. Uh, and we, uh, we share a lot of data and collect a lot of data. And we use it then for uh, preventive maintenance, uh, predicting failures and so on. So everything that we talked about uh, is very much into our business also and has been there for many, many, many years. Uh, and I think once again that almost every company will be a software company uh, in the future. Hmm. So every company should have a CTO. Absolutely. <laughs> CTOs <laughs> are uh, the core of the core. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. So, s did you have anything else that you want to comment here in the beginning? Uh, excuse me. Uh, did you have more to say right now? I have a lot of things to say, but I think uh, Let, uh, my two minutes are gone. Or okay, are let's, let's <laughs> first say thank you for that. So, so a recent study called Sweden, uh, Europe's ideal innovation test market, uh, because of several reasons. Would you agree? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. And why? Why is Sweden the ideal test market? I think that one of the main perspective is that if we, if we see digitalization as more than only techniques or technology, I, I think that we have um, a mindset that is kind of mature to do this, but we're not re uh, really there, but we could be. For example, we, 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 um, 
we are very pragmatic. It's very high of personal responsibility. Uh, we have uh, openness and, and uh, there is a high acceptance of failure, for example, which I think is one of the most important things. So, so pers when we talk about people mm. and we talk about organizations, I think we have the prerequisites. Yes. Uh, from my perspective, Sweden has a rather unique collaboration situation between industry and academia, not present in other countries at all. I think that means that in a very simple way, leading companies can be in contact with leading research in Sweden. That's not possible in other countries. Well, when I compare, we have uh, development sites uh, all over the world, and when I compare let's say the agility and to take on technology and uh, and cooperate as you said uh, it's a big difference uh, i'm saying and and sweden has a, a specific uh, way then to handle things like that on a let's say an equal basis so then if this is such a good market why does this uh, subject say what sweden can learn from germany and not the other way around I, I'm not so much into that. I mean, of course, we could learn from the whole world, uh, at least. Uh, and Germany is, of course, fantastically good. And we, by the way, we cooperate with Siemens then, integrating electrical buses then, with the whole system then, where you have the, the, the power supply and we uh, have, the, have the vehicles. So, of course, we can learn from Germany, but we can also learn from India and so on. So, we have to be open. I think we look very much at Germany now because of the unified force they have put into it from Merkel when you listen to her and every way down everyone is talking about this digital twins and so on that's a tremendous force mm. but of course we also have to look at the industrial internet consortium in US mm. to see how mm. how the development is going but the kind of directed force now being done in Germany you need to look at it and in what way would you like to look at it? Would you like Sweden to have more of a commitment or how can we speed up if we have all these good uh, circumstances to well, be better? Uh, speed up, I mean, <laughs> I'm sure of always at, at top speed already. Mm. Uh, but of course we have to look at this development, de facto standards, whatever's happening is going mm. to influence us tremendously. I think we are doing a lot of things already. So um, um, I don't. Know. Yeah, well, it's hard to say. I I, th I think the, the let's say the institute side and and the universities they of course have to also be agile in a way and we have to organize ourselves. There I think we could take a look on what Germany have done uh, going forward. So there are opportunities also going forward. And and also I think because if we talk too much about you know different countries and borders, I think that we go against <laughs> the collaboration mm. because I think that you know borders are barriers, <laughs> and 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 in a digi digital world it has to be about being connected, and if there you know it's too hard to to connect, then then it won't work. And I would say also in in that perspective, if I talk about my organization, which is you know based in the whole <coughs> Europe and try to be very, very about knowledge transfer, independent, I would say that we are very German in, in some sense. That we, we are so globalized, so, so I, I don't think that... It, it is about having role models and it is about having initiatives that we can, that we can look upon and, and that we can find our own ideas. Hmm. So Johan, next time it will not be about countries <laughs> learning from each other, it will be about sectors learning yes. from each other, if we can rephrase I, that next time. I, I fully agree with that. I mean, it's, it's, um, there's certainly stuff that Germany does well, but there's stuff that Japan does well, so everybody can learn from everybody else. And today, it's not necessarily large companies that are global only. It's right. small companies mm. who are global. They are companies who have 10 people and, and, and already have global business. So um, I think everybody can learn from everybody else. Um, but of course, countries have national interests and try to promote their, their, their home industry. And where this is where that industry 4.0 comes from. But I think companies have to be global and have to learn from global best practices. Just one reflection. And if I go back 10 years in time then and do some sort of a normalization of the technology that, that we need then to, to, uh, to manage. If you put that to one and go to 2015, it's roughly 200. And if I predict 
2020, it's 700. So it's 700 times more technology that you need than to, or combinations that you need to use. And if you don't have an open, let's say an open architecture and a way of working and uh, taking in from all ends, you will never ever succeed, mm. at least not in our industry. So what type of, if, if you're talking about, for example, uh, how you can work even closer, even mm. if you say that Sweden is, is really good when it comes to academia, but when what type of, of competences that you all see uh, industry would need in the future? What is it that you're looking for? And can you work even closer to have an ad agile university world? Mm. Or how you phrase it? I think... Uh, if at least what we, I mean, technology and everything that we have in our uh, in our uh, products, they are so complicated. We have the the human interface. If I take a look, if I drive my Volvo today, then my XC90, there is a touchpad in the middle, and then of course it's very cool to have that. But if you take a look, if you look at it and try to find what you should put that. It could be dangerous. So I mean, uh, so what type of competences do you need then? Of course, you, uh, we need uh, comp people that knows how human beings are uh, functioning mm. in a safe mm -hmm. way, at least in our industry. And then, of course, you connect that to to automation uh, and driver lessons and so on. Yeah. And if you if you look at your company, how is the ratio today between engineers and people who understand how people behave? Or what they I, I think engineers are also understand, they are also human beings, so they <laughs> understand people also. So, uh, uh, I would say it's uh, one to one then, it's 100% uh, uh, that understands people. Because our engineers, they need to understand our customers in a very good way. So, But in your, I think in your, you know, your question, uh, specialist in human machine interfaces is maybe one or two percent of our total uh, Workforce, and 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 I think also what 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 has happened is that especially we, if we talk about engineers, I'm an engineer myself, and I want to find the correct answer. And if we talk about autonomous uh, systems, you know, it might be ten answers mm. that you're looking for, or hundred, or thousands. So so it you really need to understand the whole perspective of s on, on something, that, that you need flexible solutions, that your perspective might not be enough, independent how good you are. Mm. And do you think that you're trained to learn that today in, in schools? No. Mm. So, I mean, it's... Perhaps you... One can distinguish between some different things. I think uh, automation is one thing. I mean, if you automate an in, in industrial process, you can do, do that without any intelligence at all. I mean, it's just an automation. Uh, when you talk about autonomous systems, there is, you imply that there is some sort of decision making, mm -hmm. some sort of learning. And, and then looking at these things, I mean, to have an industry 4.0, in my opinion, is much more directed to industrialization, this the industrial process. That's the production of the future. Uh, having people understanding that, I think that the operators and people, instead of stu standing at the pulpit, they have a f iPhone and they are working with the system, production system in that way. I don't think it's that difficult or dangerous. If you talk about autonomous systems, for instance, an autonomous car in public traffic in complicated scenarios, it's quite a different area. So a little bit about if you talk about the production of the future or we talk about the products of the future and the products of the future coming in to change the society of the future. There are enormous questions to be answered along the, the human relations uh, uh, aspect. Mm. Mm. I agree 100%. It's, uh, I mean, it's one thing then to, to have a as you said, then you have to build in artificial intelligence and mm. learning systems and so on. And, and we are just in the beginning of that. And we are doing that in small scale. And we are testing the autonomous vehicles, the driverless vehicles and so on in confined areas. Mm. But to, to move it into a complex uh, environment, uh, it's a big, big step. Yeah. So if we're not, so now we're not going to talk about countries anymore. No. Uh, but no. but if but if I'm now representing the Santa Claus of the world, then uh, and you could wish for something uh, from from a more 
uh, either academia or government, what would you need to make Sweden even more competitive or successful? Or not country, to make your <laughs> companies then, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's very difficult, this. I, I, I think it uh, is about both. Uh, if, if we look at the, the, the countries or the, wh where we have the most innovative uh, industries, I think that is also where we have the greatest universities. So, of course, we need to you know, put a lot of effort in, um, in education. And that is, I think that that is more or less the, the main thing. And what we can see, for example, in, in Germany, uh, there are some really, really great universities there with, uh, where we have uh, great um, engineers. But also, from a <laughs> political perspective, it is about making things easy and mm. accessible. Because it, w w we will turn up to the point, and we are already there, where we can introduce and we can make stuff but there are regulations that make it very difficult so so it's you know open up the the the, the borders more or less and and uh, to to make it easier in the collaboration between between countries and on so that we in the future it might be you know an utop utopia but that we can that we don't that we can access more or less everything it, it, it's dependent on what you know instead of where you live but are there any risks connected to being that open? Of course there are. And, and, but that is the same thing that we have asked ourselves because we always want to be in control. Because otherwise we w won't see you know, what will be in the next border report. Because you cannot predict. Mm. And, and that is you know, how, how more or less the, the business is, is, uh, uh, is run. But if we are to exchange that with trust instead, I think that we can build something that is bigger than ourselves. So now I have given you better universities and better regulations. What else are you wishing for? I think it's uh, there are many th good things, but a uh, couple of basic things done. We need to um, build, let's call it test benches for uh, risk-taking projects, so to say, where we could collaborate between universities uh, uh, industry and, and so on and that I think that is something that Sweden can do then see to that we have test benches in one way or another then mm -hmm. that where we could test future things uh, without risking so much because of course business is about risk taking but sometimes we also uh, we are a little bit more short-sighted than uh, we try to make money than three four five years ahead so when the Minister yeah. of, of Commerce and Innovation introduces uh, Sweden as a test bench, then you agree? I agree, absolutely. I mean, what should we do, you asked? I mean, when it comes to industrialization of Sweden, you, of course you have to get in the industries, so all of the industries. But if you then talk about very difficult problems like autonomous cars, I mean, it could be making clever steps and as, as you said here, I mean, test beds or applications selected carefully where you say in a mine or in a harbor where you have a confined area, it's restricted uh, access. You have people that you can educate to some extent. Starting to finding also not only tests, but also business cases for doing development and then evolving, say, for instance, the autonomous car in that kind of setting. That could be a way of bootstrapping yourself to higher and higher levels by doing something that's doable. Mm. Perhaps not jumping for the most difficult application at once. Is it also so that you need to train the citizens to learn how to adopt to all these new things that will happen or how they... Because there could be also, I think, some sort of resistance in, even if you say that it should be mm -hmm. concentrated to what users want to do, sometimes technology is a driver to introduce something sure. where maybe users or citizens are not really there yet. So it is, as, as a company, do you have some sort of responsibility also to educate citizens or users? Let's, I mean, if you... If I continue with the same thing I said just before, mm. take robots. They started an industry in the 70s and now they are slowly merging into hospitals and homes mm. and so on. 
uh, because okay they, they work in this way and everything uh, you build confidence in the way they work for instance perhaps perhaps the same with autonomous cars you see they work in certain situations and, and you mm. gain trust and then you get more and more applications Starting a big school to learn citizens, uh, um, it, it could be hard. So you but say, by, by evolution, mm -hmm. citizens and users will get used to uh, the change. choices mm. for the steps. So yes. you don't have to do any active or activation. I don't know. I, don't know. Uh, I mean, uh, talking about test benches or test beds and so on, of course, uh, it's, it's an opportunity for us to show what is possible. Mm. And then, of course, uh, I mean, uh, it's hard then to push things towards uh, a customer, you need to create some sort of a pull and then uh, all of a sudden it moves itself. So, uh, I mean, the, the test beds and the test benches and like I, I take one of our examples then when we are showing the electrical bus together with Siemens in Gothenburg where there will be a pull then for a quiet bus where you have uh, Wi-Fi and you have a possibility to whatever, connect <coughs> and so on. Uh, that is something that is needed. And then you will get the pull down for, for that type of solution for uh, public transport. By introducing them also to using it in the test bench, for example. Yeah, we, which we now we have a test bench in Gothenburg, yeah. a special road, yeah. uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is very good for us, of course, also. And I hope that's good for society going forward. Thank you. I'm, I think we will invite you, Peter, also to be part of, of uh, uh, this discussion. And I will just bring my phone so that I'll make sure that all of the questions that you're posting uh, will be will be will can, be part of. Can I this. make one comment on, yes, your, on your on your last question? Because I think that goes both ways. It's not only that we companies introduce new products and services, and we need to maybe train our customers. I think it's also vice versa that customers have new expectations on products and services that they want to consume and they show that in their buying behavior mm. so um, we will have to adapt faster and faster to what the buying behavior of our customers is and if you see how how kids grow up today they are digital natives they know how to use all the equipment that they are confronted with and they have maybe different expectations than the parents have today and uh, their kids will again have different expectations so i think it's also the consumer pretty significantly driving through buying behaviors what kind of products and services we all have to deliver in the future sure. hmm. hmm interesting <laughs> so so uh when this whole com complex way of working is increased and you were talking about risk taking for example um, what type of leadership do you need to have? Because I could see that we have trained in what I would call uh, uh, a linear way of ma making production. There is a, a type of leadership where you use lean, for example, or you have your toll gates and everything. But what do you see a change in leadership and decision making? I I <laughs> please. I mean, I think you will have uh, cognitive companions mm. giving you advice. They will surf the net, they will know everything uh, from sensor data, from the internet and so on. There are, mm. for instance, Watson software and so on that can find many things you are surprised how they do. So uh, if you drive a car, I mean, you, they will, it will tell you what to do. And that concept of a, of a cognitive <coughs> companion could be done on every level. Perhaps you don't need a leader if you have a friend that's giving you good advice all the time. Mm. So it could change uh, in that way. I think, but I think that will be a, a strong direction for how you are utilizing all the information available. Uh, I, I think we, we see it already. You have to learn how to lead in a network where you don't have higher and fire and where you are all, all over the world. Mm. Uh, and you have to collect data and you're not sitting in front of the ones that you're leading, so to say. Uh, it's a very obvious thing that will come more and more. And we have it already today. Do you have any mm. tricks how to do that? Tricks? Yeah. Uh, you have to be technical savvy to begin <laughs> with, but you, of course you have to know different cultures. How you get people moving them from Japan to, uh, or China to, uh, to US to be one team. 
and I think kids learn that nowadays now through uh, computer games and so on and many other things. And uh, we need to learn that also. And, and also if we talk about, because what we want is, and what we talk about is more of decentralized decision making. And, and there I think it's also about uh, to, to, uh, to, to push the thing about, it's a different thing of being a leader and being the boss. Because I think that leadership is about, you know, you have to deserve it. Mm. It's nothing that has been given you. And I think that you really need to understand that. And that is about being the role model. And, and I think that that is something that can be very hard because that is not something that we're used to be. <laughs> and, and it goes back very much to, to yourself in order, you know, how to, for example, how, how do you make decision making if no one tells you what to do? And I think that, you know, if we have the mindset at least that every single individual is very capable, I think that we can perform, you know, so much more. So it sounds to me that you are all actually on top of it and you are <laughs> pioneers. But if you, and you're of course here because you're experts, but if you're thinking, and maybe not in this audience, but out there, outside of this very intelligent room, what are the challenges that maybe small, medium-sized uh, companies are, you know, what, the, what do they need to confront or what do they need to start doing that they are not doing today? Learning from you. Uh, if I start with uh, my company then, or uh, it is of course a challenge and if you're a small and medium-sized company in Sweden and would like to be connected to a company like ours, mm. we would like to have service or, or, or uh, cooperation all over the world. And then all of a sudden you had a geographic problem. Uh, and, and that is of course a challenge. And how, how do I connect them to the big multinational companies yeah. and, and be a part of that? Uh, and that is, of course, uh, something that, that needs to be worked with. And th there could help from the society, of course, come in. In what way? Pooling uh, companies together, uh, supporting them then to go abroad, to establish themselves in the markets where we are, and so on. And if they would like to follow on the big companies. So almost mm. creating the arena where the companies meet and then yes. help them to f almost facilitate their way out in the world. Yeah. That could help yeah. from society, yes? If, if you're talking about companies, I mean, we already heard that, that uh, business models, how do you earn money from value in data? It's a kind of abstract. So uh, that could be a Swedish initiative perhaps to, to um, have some initiative studying how to make business, earn money, and so on. Uh, in addition, of course, to the t technological programs already existing or planned. In industrialization of Sweden is planned as a technical program from Vinova. But in addition to that, perhaps something around these questions about how to Our make business. business. modeling, mm. sharing yeah, I mean economy. I, I understand. It. I don't, it's not my field at all, so I don't know anything about <laughs> it, but I understand it's a problem. I mean... I mean, Volvo. I mean, soft, uh, Volvo cannot make money from selling ads on the mm. internet. I mean, I mean, <laughs> like a uh, business model for many big companies like Google and Facebook. Mm. They are selling ads mm. basically. That's not an easy business model for the Swedish companies. I, I would actually take like to take a little bit of different view. I think the small and medium-sized companies in this new setup are doing relatively well um, because they are more agile, can change their business model more easily. They certainly have a challenge how to globalize, how to be in every country. But today there are also technologies how you can easily be in every country and work remotely. So m from my viewpoint, the smaller company is doing relatively well. It's really the large conglomerates that, mm -hmm. that certainly have... And what do they need then? Uh, ...that have challenges. And, and here, and, and this goes back also to that leadership question... Um, in an oversimplified model, I see that almost every company has a business that, that the company needs to protect. That's a working business model, Volvo selling cars, that's a profitable business model, Volvo wants to protect that. We have our very mature business models that we want to protect. And this is more the old style approach with relatively hierarchical leadership, clear models, more the incremental improvement processes. How do you make everything a little bit better than it was mm. yesterday? But then you have these disruptive changes. Um, 
and that that requires a completely new approach from my from my viewpoint. Not hierarchical, um, working in smaller teams, working in a collaborative way, working across department and even across company borders. Completely different leadership style, um, and we have to learn that. And 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 actually. Um, we, there's one, one, I think, module in the Industry 4.0 program which is called Employment 4.0 mm -hmm. because um, it's not only the technology and the business model changes, it's the working environment is changing. Um, from my viewpoint also, years ago, the professional life and the private life were clearly separated. Today, I can't separate that anymore. Um, and that's probably true for most of us. That's hard to separate. In the past, you went to work at 8 and you went home at 5 and uh, clearly separated. Today, you get emails around the, the clock and mm. uh, work from home or go to the office. So you leave that really um, to the employee to make that choice. But what's the best uh, location to work from? So here, I th see a lot of changes. And it's not only a lot of changes that are required to get the job done. It's also an expectation from, from the next generation of, of employees. What do they expect from an employer? And th these highly educated people, they will make their decision, whom do I want to work for? Hmm. Um, and these, this decision might be based on other criteria than we all maybe have made decisions in the, in the past. So I, I think also in that environment, there are a lot of changes. And, mm. and I think it's especially the large companies that have, from my viewpoint, the bigger challenges to, to um, adopt these changes. What uh, is the, the uh, large companies? No, I, I, I can agree. And uh, what we are trying, or it is when, when you have this type of disruptive technology that's coming in, at least we are trying then to use, uh, we call it the I3 model then. We try to isolate, we try to innovate, and then we have to have people how to integrate it back in the big system. It's a challenge, we are trying to do that, and we have been successful in some cases then when we are developing unique selling points and so on. But I think I agree with you that uh, at least within the big companies, that type of uh, way of working needs to be there. Otherwise, you try, uh, tend to protect exactly what you have done then in the past. Do we have any questions? Any questions? Let's start here. Thank you for a very good interaction and, and um, discussion. Uh, I'm Johan Olsson. I'm heading a consultancy partnering with Oracle, a global company. and. Um, Many people think that uh, here in Europe, in going into digitalization and transformation, or all these words, think that we should connect more and interact more with the uh, with the people in uh, in the U.S., particularly in the Silicon Valley. Could you please comment on that? Who wants to come? Yeah. Well, I already said in the start that we have to look at different places in the world. So I, I agree completely. We have to keep watch of what's happening. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree completely and, and uh, we need to be then, we are there then to, to scout and see that, uh, that looking for the technology that is, that is needed. And of course I'm trying then to find business models or way of working which is uh, really exciting what you could see then in Silicon Valley. Um, Silicon Valley is an I believe unique environment, yes, and we can learn a lot from from Silicon Valley. And and my biggest learning from from Silicon Valley was really risk taking. I'm share a story on, on risk taking in a moment here. Um, but it's not only Sil Silicon Valley. I mean, there are other places around the world: India, China, um, and and also countries in Europe, Sweden, Germany, uh, where we can still um, learn a lot and improve a lot. But there's something which is unique. In, in Silicon Valley, in which this is the risk-taking approach. It's, it's not the big companies in Silicon Valley. They are not so much different from big companies somewhere else. But it's really the startups, um, the, the venture capital, and also large universities in Silicon Valley, which build an unbelievable ecosystem. And the large companies are part of that as well because they tend to buy the startups. Mm. Um, and the, the only goal of the startup is uh, 
commercializing the success that they create. Now, I had a, a very interesting meeting at a venture capital company a few years ago, which for me was kind of mind-blowing in terms of the, the, the approach. It was a group of Siemens people. We met with a venture capitalist and they told us, we make investments and we make high-risk investments. We are not looking for the little improvement, but we are looking for the game-changing innovation. And our in investments, 90% are a complete loss. So in, they invest in 10 companies, 10 companies go out of business, they, they lose all the money they have invested in these companies. And we said, hmm. And then somebody out of the Siemens group asked the question, um, have you ever thought about a model how you could change this ratio so that maybe two out of these 10 investments become successful? This is the typical approach that we would take, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> how do we improve the quality a little bit uh, to, to get to a, a better output? And the venture capitalist answer was very different from what all we expected. He scratched his head and said, hmm, if we had this, then we would be asking ourselves the question if we are taking enough risk. Hmm. So very different. So their criteria is not getting more on the safer side and having uh, uh, more of the investments go through, but they want to, to go for the big things. Um, and, and this is just a very different approach, a very different culture. Usually not present in larger companies. The larger companies are the taking the small steps, making the product a little bit better. And, and this is what, ki what is kind of unique. And yes, can we learn from that? Certainly. Yeah. I'm just thinking how you integrate that learning into your big company. But I'm not going to ask that now because <laughs> there, was an, there is one question there first and then there and then there. there. Yeah. On end there. <laughs> Hello, my name is Olaf Sanden. I head up uh, RISE Research Institute of Sweden. I'd like to go back to the original question of what can Sweden learn from Germany. I'm still hoping that there might be some more on that topic. And since we have uh, uh, Siemens here, both from a Nordic and a German side, uh, what have you seen in terms of Industry 4.0 that has really put uh, a focus into the German and or the Swedish industry in terms of getting prepared or being more agile in the change that is being asked for pretty much by digitalization? Uh, and is there anything there in terms of the, uh, the um, clearness and the drive that uh, at least I s think that uh, the German organization have been able to build in Industry 4.0? I mean, if there's one thing, and I've want to re if I want to reduce it to one thing, it has been a wake-up call for the German industry. I mean, it was a few companies who started to think and who had, who can afford strategy groups who can think forward for the next ten years, and um, th these companies got together and said, "Well, there there will be an another revolution, and we believe things are are coming down the road," and and then. Industry 4.0 was certainly somewhat a wake-up call for the German industry. I mean, there was on on every media channel, Industry 4.0 was covered. Um, so even the smallest company in in Germany has heard Industry 4.0, and and the CEO of the, even the smallest company, hmm, probably I need to think about what that means for my business. Um, and and I think this message was very loud and clear in, in Germany, that we cannot rest on what we have achieved, but there will be change, and we better embrace the change as an opportunity and uh, don't hope that uh, it will go, uh, go by and uh, not change our, our businesses. I think that's probably out of the whole industry 4.0, Point zero initiative in Germany, the biggest achievement. That, and I see that in my personal customer contacts. That has significantly changed over the last three years. The wake-up call. Here we had a question. Ulf Lindberg from Enhancer Management Consultants Company. A couple of weeks ago in Financial Times, it was an article uh, that claimed that Warren Buffett and uh, 
BlackRock and other major uh, asset managers uh, met in a secretive meeting, and what they discussed was guys like you. They felt that companies were uh, too short-termish, that they didn't have enough long-term strategic thinking, and that they did not include digitalization, innovation, and transformation in, in their strategic thinking to, to, to the degree needed. And of course, that doesn't go for your companies, but, uh, but uh, what, what do you comment to, to, to their, uh, because they wanted to, to have much tougher governance related to this topic, that's why they met. I can oh. only say I was not in that meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Neither was I. No. I mean, when when it comes to long-term strategies, at least we are trying then to look 15 years ahead, uh, and even more. Uh, and of course, digitalization and automation and all those type of things. What what uh, what that creates is of course a major thing for us when we are plan. But is it possible to look ahead 20 years? Now, uh, of course, you could. Uh, I mean, the the further out you guess, more and more. But uh, I mean, you could have uh, scenario planning and so on, and, uh, and that you need to do. Otherwise, you end up in the wrong way. But also, it comes back to what do you want? What, what is it that you want to achieve? Uh, be because I think that as so many things are changing, it's so difficult to say that, to, to make it too concrete. And that is also why I think that more and more companies go, for example, being value driven, or they put something else instead. And I think that that is what Industry 4.0 is as well. It is, you know, an arena to, to start talking about these things, because that is also what we have heard in Germany, is that this has actually created connections between between companies because finally we have something in common to talk about and then we have different ideas of what it is and what it isn't but that is not maybe the most important thing so a catalyst to talk about the right things yeah you, you could say yeah i think there are more things to talk to you about later <laughs> maybe uh we had a question over there and then we have one over there and then we have one over there and then maybe we wrap up yeah Okay, my name is Hamdia. I'm a uh, founder of a small company, 150 employees. And um, I think the challenges is a little bit what you talked about in Industry 5.0 or 4.0. Uh, we are a small, medium-sized enterprise, and um, some large companies, one of them is German, you know, Swedish, are choosing us as a strategic partner in their global industries, uh, alongside with the employees that have uh, companies that have 100,000 uh, employees. So sometimes I think you're too optimistic thinking that the, the answer is in Silicon Valley. Uh, and we have offices in Lund, uh, Malmö, uh, Gothenburg and Stockholm. And you don't dare to look at small enterprises and challenge, let them challenge you. Uh, so, so I think uh, the big challenge is about leadership that you talked about before. And looking at the report from Davos uh, right now, I think the big challenge in 4.0 is the leadership in, in companies. So I don't think you have to look about, uh, look, try to look, find those companies uh, outside of Sweden. There, there are some, a lot of them are inside of Sweden as well. They should start looking We're here. Any reflections on that? No, no I, I, I agree. I mean, Silicon Valley is, of course, uh, an inspiring uh, source of ideas. But of course, we have a lot of very good, good uh, innovation in Sweden. No doubt about that. I can just add something else to that. We found a disruptive technology in the airline industry. Mm -hmm. And it was hard to sell it because of the leadership in those companies. And now Dubai is going to buy this uh, uh, big opportunity. So, so I think uh, there are a lot of challenges here. Thank you that there are. Because I, I almost did not hear any challenges here for a while. But there are some. There are some. Uh, uh, there are some. There are some. Okay. <clears throat> coming back here with some reflections. First of all, thank you very much. It has been a fantastic uh, introduction in 4.0 and uh, also coming from a company where we have been working according to those ideas quite some years, not understanding it has been 4.0. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have the brand. Yeah, but uh, uh, I've done some reflections throughout each, uh, these years and uh, in the connectivity with the customers, it has always been easy to convince the small customers, the small enterprises. And uh, they're very curious, they jump on it and they see all the advantages. 
when you go from uh, big companies, it takes very long time to get access to people. People on, uh, let's say, lower level levels, they understand, but on higher levels, medium and higher, it takes very long time to convince the people. And I used to say to some of them, it's like the Galilei project here in Europe to compete with the GPS system of the US. We have been talking about that now almost 30 years, and it has not fly, been flying. It's not flying today. And I think that uh, there is a question here, because the, the, uh, this 4.0, what we do is that with the networking, all that, we move information information out to the customer. It means we move the focus from the company out to the customer and we get the customer driven development, production, all that mm. what you from Siemens have been talking about. Question here is what are the chances that the big organizations will survive? Mm, in this that's life, a uh, big question. <laughs> it's the meaning of life for a big... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so what's your response? I, uh, my response is that if we are agile enough and uh, work with uh, different ways of, um, as I said then, uh, trying then to split the big companies in smaller innovative parts, and but also have the ability then to integrate backwards when that is done, you have to understand how the big company is working. That's our way then to survive. And there are many other things also, but that, that is one way to survive going forward. My answer also coming from a big company is clearly yes, the big companies <laughs> will survive, but they will significantly change. Um, in Siemens, we have in, in every business unit a digitization strategy. And this is not only a paper that's in somebody's drawer, but that's something that's being implemented that every business unit CEO tracks and that then is being aggregated on a, on a corporate level. So at least only speaking for Siemens, we have very well understood that we have to transform every single business that we have in Siemens. So no business in Siemens will look the same in 10 years from now. And do they, are, are they all on the same path? No, they all have to go their individual routes and, and certainly have varying strategies, um, but it's for each business, digitization is one of the core activities that they are driving. Yes, uh, I, I think that the first of all, to try to understand what you should do, you have to understand where you are. And I think that, uh, for example, the, the Fraunhofer uh, report, that is benchmarking. They try to, to understand, you know, what this, uh, what is happening in this area and, and, and uh, all of them inputs from from different uh, different countries and areas but they put four benchmarks and they talk about technology they talk about people organizations and business environment and i think that they are very good to start with to see you know what is my my company's matureness in these four for sectors, for example, tr to try to understand where should I invest. Of course, you would, would find out that you have to do something in every area, but you have to focus because sometimes I think, especially at big companies, we try to do too many things at the same time. Thank you. And the last question. Well, I'm trying to formulate the question, but I'm, uh, so please forgive me for being pro perhaps a little bit confusing, but uh, uh, you talked about business models and I mean the new business models that will appear and that you're already seeing them. But looking at the startup scene in, in, in Sweden and in Germany, for instance, you have many companies who have invented new business models, but it's in industries where it's, you sort of know the product. It's Uber, it's music, it's uh, uh, online sales, etc. But in large organizations where you have very, what you do, people on the outside don't really know what you're doing on the inside. And still you have these small companies that are very innovative, but they're working, working mainly in media, gaming, fintech as well. Um, how could you sort of harness their innovation potential? Could, is there any way, or how do you work with them at Siemens? Because I think you mentioned that you worked with startups and entrepreneurs as well, but how do you, do you need to, or can you just start innovate new business models yourself? Or do you need input from the outside? I guess that's my question, how, and how could you do that? Because uh, I, I could start, of course, we need input from outside. And 
one part of it is of course then to have an architecture then when it comes to software and so on that is open enough uh, as I talked about then we have so much then to cover so we can't cover it ourselves so it's a need for us going forward to have an open architecture so that we could connect uh, innovative smaller business into our own business and and and, uh, and integrate that so that is an absolute must and when it comes to the techno or the the software area we are working on uh, opening up the architecture going forward so that is one part connecting well my, my, my answer to that is of course we all know the 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 startups the famous ones, the unicorns that uh, created a business out of nothing by just meeting a customer demand and scaling it up. Um, but if you look at all the traditional business in any company, um, these businesses have significantly changed. And if I look at our businesses at, at Siemens, we have changed over the last 10, 15 years tremendously. Um, but the difference is there was a business already there and of course we protected this business and saved that and continued and improved that. But we have added a lot of stuff. We have added a lot of new go-to-market models. Like 10 years ago, we didn't do any online sales. Now we do. Uh, we have created a completely different product uh, portfolio. Um, our customers have a different different value proposition that they ex expect. So there is a lot of change also in established companies. What, what we of course all know is the, the sp these famous startups, but also the, the companies that we interact with on a daily basis, which are not startups, have changed quite a bit. So banks have changed quite a bit. Um, their services have changed tremendously over the last 20 years. So if you reflect all these business that you interact with mm. on a daily basis, you, you would see that even the very established businesses have changed quite a bit. Lars? Well, <coughs> two parts of your question. I mean, uh, Uber, for instance, they, they uh, are deploying uh, using existing infrastructure that's not fully used. I mean, empty cars driving around. And of course, now everyone is looking for infrastructure already available houses, hospitals, wherever there are empty rooms or empty resources not being used. You are trying to create a business now by connecting something. And then the other things like music and so on when you are selling uh, um, digital products. That's also easy to scale up. The other part of your question is uh, was about, uh, for instance, gaming and gamification. And interestingly enough, we have, I mean, Industry 4.0 from, from Germany. We have an Industrial Internet Consortium in the US. The Japanese counterpart seems, we don't, I don't know the details, but it seems that they are adding a twist along the gaming and gamification of, I mean, not only development by, but production and business model using this gamification. It's, it's a rather new concept, but it's well known all over the world, but it's coming now. So in Japan, I would say some of your, part of your question, they are addressing it more than we see in Germany or US. Matthias. Yeah, uh, I, I just thought that because we have, we, we, it's so stuck in our mind that because we are in a big company, we cannot be entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is something within the whole thinking that is wrong. And I think that that is what we need to change. Because why wouldn't it be instead of having several, you know, if, if we have 10,000 employees, why isn't that the force of 10,000 employees instead of the force of one? And I think that this is something that we really need to, to, to find solutions for because otherwise we, we will end up in in uh, in having as as the as the questions from from Leif as well, we, the the huge companies will die. So everyone will be not only a software company, but also a company driven by a force of entrepreneurs. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Oof, may, so may I come with yes. a, <laughs> with a question? And this is the last question. And and what do you think about the public sector being so far away from the customers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but, but also what, what, what we have seen is, for example, that w why we talk about Industry 4.0 today is because digitalization in other sectors have went very well. 
if it was a disaster, we wouldn't be here talking about it. So I would say that if the private, in the, we, we have to do what we can. And also, if it is like the uh, public uh, uh, is, is lacking, yeah, well, of course, they need to change. And sometimes it is about uh, privatization or, or something like that. I think we can also <laughs> ask that question to uh, uh, Anders, who will give the, the closing remarks. Uh, so, um, if you were just now finishing, and, and now I'm going to ask you to just uh, give a word or a sentence for one piece of advice to throw out to this audience, what would it be? Um it would be to to learn from others uh, learn from others yes <laughs> it's going to be rapid <laughs> yeah learn from others well, i had almost the same continue to learn from germany continue to <laughs> learn from germany <laughs> but also us and japan and especially. us and japan especially. yes i had openness to innovation also. openness yeah. to innovation and peter I, I actually steal mine um i heard that from somebody else but i really liked it um don't protect the past from the future, but protect the future from the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. A great <laughs> panel. Thank you. And let's now invite Anders Lundberg, who is the member of uh, the Swedish Parliament, to give some closing remarks. And will you ask... Yeah. And, and re you could also maybe uh, respond to the question, if you want to, uh, if the public sector <laughs> is not <laughs> as good as the industry to uh, listen to their customers? It depends on what. <laughs> In prisons, they're not. And I'm glad for that. Um, I will not have any views on how to build trucks. So I, I uh, refrain from commenting on that. But there's a couple of things I, I want to talk about. Firstly, of course, the government's policies on new industrialization or reinvention of industry, really. As this government has put forward as one of the priorities is industry and uh, was not, has not been talked about very much for maybe 10 years or so, but, but now it is again. And, and as I listened tonight, most of the things are mentioned in that program, and of course, that shows that they've been talking to industry before written, uh, uh, writing the program. And it's four parts in the program. It's digitalization. They even call it 4.0, uh, probably stolen from Germany with pride. Um, the second one is called sustainability, which is both uh, productivity and and. Uh, long-term sustainability in different senses. The third part is about what you talked about, the competence, all the way from universities through the schools, but also how to knowledge lift uh, the workforce to be able to perform in, in the rapid changes that industry are going through. And the fourth is test beds, test bed Sweden, and in all sectors one should do that. The second thing is that um, uh, the Prime Minister has put up, put up an innovation council. We have one of the members here, Ola, sitting there. And um, they have made three priorities where digitalization is one, climate is one, and life science is the third one. And apart from being a member of parliament, I'm actually the coordinator for life science for the government of, for Sweden. So the examples I will want to bring up now will come from that sector. But it's also an important sector. It's the largest one in the world. It's the most rapid uh, growing one. It's about 10% of the world economy. It will become maybe 20% by 2050. So it's a very important part. And I want to tell you an anecdote from the start, which happens, uh, this is all actually very true. Started in Stockholm seven years ago. A company came forward, said that, we have now a spirometer who measures the lungs, uh, which is electronic and, and digital and connected. And also an oxytometer, which measures the oxygen in the blood. And it should be used for COPD patients, cool patienter in Swedish, and that can measure, if they blow every day, we can see when they get an attack or an exacerbation three days ahead. And we could treat that um, 
so you don't have to go to hospital. Because if you get an attack, it's three weeks in hospital and 300,000 crowns in cost. And they've tested it in, in London, and they wanted to test it here. They would pay for everything. The nurse who would have connect, uh, the connectivity with, with the patients, and 50 units. And everybody said, but this is fantastic. Let's do that. Everybody agreed. But when we should choose a hospital that should use it, all the hospitals said no. And the interesting thing is, why? Well, the first answer is that we get paid. Our business model is that we get paid when patients come to see us. These patients will not come. We will go bankrupt. So we cannot use this technology because uh, uh, that will make us bankrupt. But then we said, told them that, well, let's reimburse you in another way. So you will get the money. And then they said, no, we don't want to have two business models. But secondly, which is more important after a while, that means that I, in the long run, need 80 people instead of 140 in my clinic. And then I will have three years with um, media, uh, with uh, negotiations, with the unions, with the hard time, and especially we are being measured how important we are in this hospital by how many people are working for us. And over my dead body, I will take up a new uh, technology that will uh, rationalize my staff. So there's a lot of cultures here going on. But what it's also saying is that politics cannot only um, take up digitalization. It has to understand that you need to renew reimbursement systems. You have to understand that actually the laws that we are using today are not uh, efficient anymore. For example, integrity for patients. That is written all over Europe and has been debated in EU actually uh, this week. Uh, are saying that integrity is only pointed at uh, treatment for patients. But nowadays we get information that could be used for continuous learning within healthcare to evaluate quality of healthcare and for a number of other purposes. But the laws are not admitting us to do that. So there's a number of things, responsibility, um, governance, laws. There's a whole chain of things that has to be changed to be able to uh, adapt into the new world in a sense. Now, healthcare and life science both have the most um, cutting technology. They're using nanotechnologies. They're using ethics from the old Greeks, and they're using everything in between. And that means that not everything goes very well all the time. And uh, we have some examples of that. Um, one example is the um, IT system which Siemens is working with. Five years ago, Stockholm had 38 um, medical record systems. Uh, and they worked as a play written by Lars Norén, uh, like a monologue uh, out in a cold Nordic night. And, Nobody was listening, but they were talking to themselves, and they could not communicate with anybody else. And that has to be changed, of course. And also, if we do that and connect them to the registers for qualities, we will learn much new knowledge, how to treat people and um, the causes of illness. Um, they like new technology. One should not say no to that. For example, they're still using fax when they communicate to each other. My daughter asked me the other day, what is fax? And, uh, and I said, well, um, it, it's interesting. I cannot even explain it anymore. But they're using it. And they're also asking for new technology. A lot of, in the healthcare want to have mobile faxes now. Uh, they're asking for that. And, and so we say they're a little bit after in certain senses in, in, in technology. And... Um, Technology changes goes very quickly. For example, when I grew up, to be able to be on, on a stamp, which you send a letter with, you have to either be a king or you should be dead for 100 years. Uh, five years ago, nobody had ever heard of Avicii. Now he's on a stamp. And it took only four years. Um, and that divides people into two groups. The ones, 
over 35 who is asking, who the hell is Avicii? And the one under 35 who is asking, what the hell is a stamp? Because they don't use them anymore. So, um, but the priorities are that. And collaboration, using procurement, it's six to 800 billion Swedish crowns every year is procured to the private sector from the public. You like those, Leif, right? Yeah. And we could use those more intelligently. And what everybody was saying here, collaboration instead of trying to compartize and not having contacts, which has been very popular in Sweden for maybe 20 years, is now the model. Triple helix, everybody should be a part of, of everybody else's business. That's how you go forward. And in the end, we will end up in a situation where instead of getting a hard time um, getting an appointment with the doctor, you, we will hear, hear from the doctor. The patients will see you now, doctor. Thank you. Well, there's tradition in the academy that we try to stick to the hours uh, that have been set, and this gives me a very short time to finish and uh, conclude the remarks. I will not make a sum up, but only uh, wish to express our appreciation uh, for what we've heard today. Uh, Peter started by referring to the saying that uh, the world is, change, uh, is, uh, is changing faster than ever before. Uh, it's been put in another way as well, and uh, the greatest change uh, the single most important change in our time is the change in the rapidity of change. It expresses the same thing. And uh, I think we have uh, realized uh, how things are moving fast. Uh, we, um, uh, Leif Östling said we got a fantastic introduction into what's happening in Germany. Uh, the um, industry uh, 4.0 as a concept originates from uh, Germany, uh, but also, of course, uh, it serves as an inspiration in many other countries where, of course, action, we've seen it and heard it, the action has been taken earlier in a great number of, uh, by government, by industry, so it's nothing new, but it's focusing on it, and as uh, Lisa said, it might have served as a wake-up call, and uh, uh, as you said, uh, that may be the most, single most important message from, uh, from Germany in this respect. Now, uh, I think the, the discussion was fascinating in many respects. Uh, um, discussion on whether this pertains primarily to large or small or medium-sized companies. I mean, this was a discussion 30 years ago. Uh, a small and medium-sized enterprise was small three years ago. It is large today. Uh, and uh, I mean, look at some of the very largest ones. They're only 10 years old. Now, personally, I have some experience from one very small company 10 years ago where the risk of getting larger is that you become less agile. And so this is a great challenge. It is a combination of small and medium-sized enterprises and large enterprises and trying to get a, 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 an excellent, uh, well-functioning interface between the two. So this seminar, this is, is only one in a series uh, of activities in Sweden at large and uh, of course, uh, elsewhere in the world. And I think one of the conclusions here is, while we said what, we can, we, what can Sweden learn from Germany, uh, one of the conclusions is uh, that uh, maybe we should also have discussed, and we did discuss, what can we learn uh, from each other. Learning what's uh, happening in other countries, uh, trying to identify the role models, uh, trying to identify best practice, and uh, then to adopt it and adapt it to the individual companies. So, uh, I, for one, I think uh, you agree with us that uh, we have had uh, two fascinating hours, uh, and uh, I would like, on behalf of the Academy and of the Program Committee, to thank, um, uh, in the first instance, uh, Peter and the panelists, and uh, uh, as a token of our appreciation, I would like them to come forward, uh, and um, uh, Peter, there's no... No, not too big for an air uh, flying back today. Huh? Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Please, um, Lars. <laughs> Lars and Matthias and, and, uh, and Peter. Yeah.
Thank you. Matthias, thanks for your Thank you. Thank you. And now we give them a big, big hand. And then Lisa. Thank you to you. Thank you. Thanks. Come up here as well. Thank you so much. Well done. Thank you. And all the people. Now, time for dinner. Uh, you'll follow those who know the premises. Uh, and again, thank you all for coming here tonight.